uh, well, like according to my clock, anyway, it's uh, 1,400 hours <laughs> to a clock. So. Uh, <laughs> some, some of us uh, adhere to a uh, 24-hour clock, and some of us adhere to our own clock. So. <laughs> In any event, uh, first order of business would be the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, all that are able, please rise. I pledge allegiance Our normal format for the uh, uh, business meetings uh, for the uh, Hot Springs County uh, Historical Society usually begins with the uh, uh, previous meeting minutes, and those uh, that previous meeting was on November 13th. And Carol Schaefer, our secretary, uh, will read the minutes from that meeting. Historical Society meeting was called to order by Vice President Rick uh, Hudson on November 13, 2021 at 2 o'clock in the Hot Springs County Museum and Cultural Center. The Pledge of Allegiance was recited. The minutes from the October 9, 2021 meeting was read by Carol Schaefer, Acting Secretary. It was the consensus of those attending that the minutes be approved as read. Rick reported that he had mailed the October 2020 to September 2021 tax return to the Wyoming State Historical Society as it had to be in by November 11, 2021. Rick gave the current treasurer report as follows. After paying Eddie Cole $50 for his presentation of his program together with a historical so society membership, $60 reimbursement to the Pioneer Association for the summer trek the balance remaining in the checking account was $2,619.29, $3,751.55 in the savings account, two CDs designated for the maintenance of the horse statue downtown and Monument Hill. It was a consensus of those attending that the treasurer's report be approved as given. Rick then gave his vice president's report. Since the last meeting, Rick and the other two board members have had meetings and have had gone through the records trying to piece together all that was given to the board from Chairman Joe Marshall following Sam Marshall's demise. We have a roster of membership which shows in excess of 60 members, thorough financial records and secretary records. It was the consensus of those attending the meeting that if you present your membership card showing that you paid through 2021, your membership will actually be paid through 2022. There was no old business from last month. The amendment of the bylaws was last done January 2020, wherein the dues were ch changed from $5 to $10. A quorum in order to amend the bylaws was ascertained. There was some discussion regarding when dues would be paid. Rick stated that as far as he was concerned, the change in the fiscal year was only for the purpose of reporting. Dues would continue to be collected as done the past, in the past at the Christmas dinner in December. A motion was made, seconded, and carried that the bylaws under Article 4, Membership, Section 5, Fiscal Year, would read, the fiscal year shall be the same as the calendar year, January 1 through December 31, shall be amended to read, the fiscal year shall be October 1 through September 30. The next agenda item was the election of officers. A full slate of officers was presented consisting of Rick Hudson, President, Barbietti, Vice President, Carol Schaefer, Secretary, Gary Allheiser, Treasurer, Ray Schaefer, Director, John Vietti, Director. 
Ellen Mortimer made a motion to accept the slate of officers as presented. Motion was seconded by Sha Sandy Schaefer. Motion carried. These officers will serve a two-year term. Under other business, Ray Schaefer was recognized and stated that the hill and the horse statue needed to be taken care of maybe sometime in March or when the weather is warm enough to work on both projects. <coughs> Discussion was had regarding getting other organizations to help out. Marvietta stated that at one time, the class reunion weekend, those that were attending painted the hill. Rick asked Ray if he would be willing to head up these projects. Ray agreed. Rick then announced that the next meeting would be in com would be the combined Christmas dinner. It will be held December 5th, 2021, approximately at noon at the Senior Center. At that time, dues for 2022 will be taken. Rick also reported that there will be a Zoom meeting with the state on November 19th at 10 a.m. If anyone is interested, let Rick know and he can give you the log information needed. The next meeting will be January 9th, 2022 at 2 p.m. There being no further business, the meeting was turned over to Toby Johansson, commander of the VFW Post 2281 in Thermopolis. Toby talked about the activities going on at the VFW. He has just recently assumed the position of commander and is attempting to rebuild the post while simultaneously remodeling the club and meeting rooms. He provided information on upcoming events and projects ongoing with the post. Toby also presented a PowerPoint of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. All in, the, all, in all, the presentation was very informative. Toby was then given a stipend and a 2022 membership to the Historical Society. The meeting was adjourned and refreshments were provided. Respectfully committed, Carol Shaver, Acting Secretary. Thank you, Carol. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion to approve Carol's report. You said the meeting today would be the 9th. It's the 8th. What's a day between friends? <laughs> <laughs> uh, motion to approve by uh, Linda Abel. Second. Nancy and a second by Nancy. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Carol. We'll have a short report uh, by uh, Barb Vietti on the uh, annual dinner that we had on uh, December 5th. Just a little show of hands. How many people went to our dinner? Oh, yes, yay! <laughs> Thank you for everybody for coming. I just want to let you know that our kind of the highlight of our year is our Christmas dinner. It's the, always the first Sunday in December. And it's a potluck dinner, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, we had a great crowd. Uh, it wasn't our biggest crowd, but this was, we didn't have a, a, a dinner last year. So we were kind of, or we were getting back into the swing of things. And, uh, and so we did have our dinner this year. We had uh, 60 to 70 people come. And uh, it, it was a, a good time was I had by Hall. Ellen, is Ellen here, Mortimer? She led us in Christmas carols. We had raffles. It, it was a wonderful time. So for those of you who did not come last year in 2021, put it on your calendars for this year, 2022. Come to our Christmas dinner because it's definitely worthwhile. We appreciate it. Does anybody have any comments about the dinner? How, how, you, how you'd like to change it or make any corrections or anything? We're, we're open for, for suggestions. We we're probably going to try to have it again at the senior center. It's a great place uh, to have it. Uh, we've got plenty of room, plenty of parking, and uh, it's uh, plenty of light so we can see what we're eating. So, uh, <laughs> it, it was delicious. It was delicious. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I, I cooked all morning. But, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. but anyway, for, uh, thank you very much for those uh, to those that, that came. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Barb. It was a, a, a very enjoyable uh, dinner. Uh, we're getting back to uh, normal uh, routine and normal activities after the COVID uh, situation of uh, the past uh, year and a half. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be more in tune with what we've done in the past. The uh, next item on the agenda is the uh, treasurer's report uh, by Gary. 
I think he's still taking dues out there. What we've done this year, for those of you that uh, may not be aware of it, in the past we had uh, Secretary Treasurer as, as a combined office with one person, and uh, because of the situation that we had uh, with uh, Sam uh, Marshall and, and with Doty, uh, Carol and Joe, uh, we decided that it would probably be in our best interest to uh, to separate the, the secretary and the treasurer. So now we, we do have secretary, uh, Carol Schaefer, and uh, treasurer, which is uh, Gary Oldheimer. And that seems to be working much better. It takes, takes a lot of the load off of one person, and it also uh, allows us to, uh, uh, to have uh, uh, a, a, better, a, a better feel for... Uh, uh, both of those offices. So, and the uh, bylaws did, did allow that, so we didn't have to amend the bylaws. So we're we're in good condition or in good shape on that. Uh, we did uh, amend our bylaws for the uh, fiscal year. We took care of that. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, run on our on our current uh, bylaws uh, without any more uh, uh, amendments, at least for a while. So any anything to uh, make it a little smoother. It's fine, fine with the president. I think it's fine with uh, the other uh, officers, including the uh, two directors that we have. Uh, might incidentally uh, point out the uh, other two directors. Uh, Ray Schaefer, uh, past president, uh, is, is uh, one of our directors. And uh, John Vietti, uh, Bart's husband, is also our, our second uh, Director. We we'll use this time as long as uh, uh, we have a, a few extra minutes. Uh, anything from the floor? Uh, Let me get my report. Oh, my <laughs> okay. Gary, Gary slipped okay. in on, okay. the, on the back door. Yeah. Okay, on the treasurer's report, um, we had a balance uh, on November. 17th of 2,593 and 35 cents. Um, we had membership uh, dues that came in in uh, our December party and we collected $520. Um, our dinner expenses were $150 and eight cents. The balance uh, per our bank statement on December uh, 16th was 2,963.29 and uh, we have an outstanding check that hasn't shown yet that will be on our next statement and that was, a, excuse me, $160 that is that goes for state dues. So our current balance as of today is $2,803.29. That is what we have and then also we have two CDs, uh, and I don't have the report on those, but uh, that's what our what we have for our historical society budget. That's what I'm presenting. Thank you, Gary. Uh, formal motion to approve Gary's report from the floor. I'll make a motion. Approve. Ellen Gallion made the motion. Second. We have a second. Uh, <laughs> All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Rick, I yes. have a question. Sure. We've had the CDs forever and ever and ever. I don't think they have ever been used, even when we did do the hill and all that sort of stuff. Is there a reason why we're keeping them as CDs rather than cashing them out and putting them in the account? Well, not to my knowledge, uh, Ray, you, you're probably more familiar with those CDs. Well, at, at one time you could make a little interest on the CD, so that's where they put it, stuck it, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of a moot point anymore. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> some of the other organizations have been in putting in money markets, maybe a little bit, but I don't know. It's, it's something you can write a check on and get out. You know. I don't know if it really matters or not at this point. Oh. <coughs> uh, yeah, with with the situation with with the interest rates being what they are. Uh, any comments from the floor regarding you know, 
one way or the other, whether we keep them uh, or, or cash them in and put it into uh, savings? My, my thought was that if they're in either a money market or in the savings or in the other checking account, when we need it in order to do the hill or to do some maintenance on the horse, we can get to it. Right now, you can't get us to a CD until it comes due, and that may be way beyond what you're gonna, you know, try and accomplish. That was the only thing I was thinking. Okay. Well, currently, a money market makes more interest, and it is accessible than a CD. Yeah. So it would be a win-win to switch it to a money market. I just know on the one CD, we got like a dollar for interest for the yeah. year, so <laughs> it didn't do very well, so I mean, that's uh, what I would suggest then, uh, we have uh, director's meetings on a regular basis. We can kick it around, and then we'll we'll bring it bring back our recommendation to the general membership, uh, probably for the February meeting if if that would work. Okay. Sound good to everyone? Yeah. We'll we'll get on that. So thank you, Carol. That's yeah. a good, a, a, an excellent point to bring up. Next on the agenda, uh, item six, old business from the uh, November meeting. Uh, there's none that I'm aware of unless someone else uh, uh, has uh, any old business they want to uh, bring up and discuss again. Going once, going twice, it's sold. Uh, we have uh, possibility for new business and I'll just open that up to the floor uh, I don't have anything uh, that's come come to my uh, interest uh, does anyone else have any new business they'd like to discuss can be on any subject uh, that pertains to our our chapter moving right along then <laughs> announcements uh, I don't have any particular announcements. Uh, we will uh, uh, be attempting to have regular meetings now, uh, get back into our, our usual uh, schedule, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to have uh, uh, the picnic and also possibly uh, work in a, 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 at least one trek uh, this summer. So we're, we're, uh, we're attempting to uh, uh, normalize our, our activities. So. Any other announcements from anyone? This is this is a good meeting. We're moving right along here. Thank you, Ray. Can you announce next month's program? You're going to do that later. Uh, I can announce it. I, I think I think we've locked into it. Uh, we uh, asked uh, uh, Carol Mills from. Uh, uh, Tensley, if he would give us a presentation. Terrell, Terrell has presented several uh, 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 or, uh, uh, stories. They're, they're actually, they're, they're, he's more of a storyteller than he is a, uh, uh, anything, anything else. And he has, uh, he, he was going to be here for this uh, month's meeting and uh, it didn't work out. Uh, he has, has uh, indicated to us that he, he will definitely be here for the February meeting. And I, I uh, don't know precise. I do know, but Barb. You got his title if you want it. Let's, let's do it. I think I do too. If I, uh, Bar Barb's just handier. <laughs> okay. I, it, it took a while to get it from him. Uh, but it's a, his, uh, the title of his talk next week or next month is going to be The Elopement of Furtick and Sycophus, also called The Bridger Mystery. I'm going to read the first couple sentences um, about, his, about this talk. Searching for the eloping couple from Tensley, Wyoming, for where, the, for where the local officers were on the lookout last week, it has been abandoned and at least at this end of the line, supposed to have been taken up by lovers, but the mystery of their disappearance is growing deeper. I'm just reading it out of you. <laughs> That's 
So that's kind of what it's going to be about. Other than that, I don't know anything. Uh, those of you that uh, have uh, been been uh, present with uh, Carol's uh, <coughs> presentations, there, as I said, he, he's he's a storyteller. Uh, he he uh, uh, can go into into great detail. Sometimes he digresses, but sometimes uh, storytellers uh, that that's a good trait. So anyway, uh, we're we're looking forward to to bringing Carol back uh, next month. So. The, uh, any other announcements for, from anyone? Okay. The next regular meeting will be Saturday, uh, February 12th, and that will uh, correspond, of course, with uh, Lincoln's birthday. Otherwise, uh, I don't think we need to do a formal uh, motion for an adjournment. We can do it by consensus. Any other business before we close out? We're done. We'll get it. Oh, Lee, got to be quick, boy. Yeah. Got to be quick. I have a couple recommendations for acquisitions. Okay. One is Guinea Yetter has an incredible steam engine that came from the Yetter sawmill up in Enos. It's top quality. It really needs to be here. Okay. And secondly, I've got a huge collection of axes and stuff. I'd be willing to donate about 15 or 20 pieces to see it. Okay. And then there's a guy named Eddie Schaefer around here that has some really nice wagons. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've heard that. I haven't seen any, but I've heard. And I've seen your axes, and I know it's an extensive, extensive collection. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right, that uh, I think uh, concludes our business meeting. Uh, I'll turn it over. Bar Barb has uh, graciously agreed to uh, uh, announce our presenter, uh, and I'll uh, turn it over to her. So, thank you. You're probably getting tired of seeing me. I'll get down real fast. Um, I first met Bonnie at uh, a Wyoming uh, 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 Archaeological Society uh, uh, annual meeting up in Cody. And uh, I, if in, any of you haven't uh, been at one of those meetings, they're wonderful. You get to find out all kinds of uh, things going on all over the state, and, uh, and she was a part of that. So uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce her. There she is. <laughs> so I, I, and she has a little write-up in the paper, and I, I, I'm just going to read it again because it uh, gives you an idea of, uh, of what, 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 what she is. Bonnie Lawrence Smith is a Wyoming native and archaeologist who explores the relationships between early indigenous peoples and golden eagles in the Bighorn Basin. She is the former curatorial assistant for the Draper Natural History Museum in Cody and co-curator of Monarch of the Skies, on exhibit now at the Center of the West. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Bonnie. Okay, so I'm not a storyteller. I'm pretty straightforward, so <laughs> I won't digress. Um, uh, like Barb said, I am a Wyoming native, born and raised. Uh, I worked previously at the Draper Natural History Museum in Cody, where I was able to uh, work alongside Dr. Charles Preston doing Golden Eagle research. Uh, coming from a background of archaeology, it makes sense that I went to work for a wildlife biologist, right? Not so much. So, let's just clear things up right away. I'm an archaeologist. I don't dig dinosaurs. I've got family members that have known what I've been doing for close to 30 years, and they still like, oh, I found this dinosaur bone. I'm like, fascinating. <laughs> Okay, so one of the definitions I'd like to talk about, uh, to use when I talk about rock art, is that it's a global expression of preliterate cultures communicating belief systems through visual, communally understood drawings or motifs. Because it, this is pre-written work, right? And so it's like these, these images that are on stone need to convey certain messages to everyone. And... Like I said, it's a global form of expression. We have it in Spain, France, 
Australia. Uh, you guys probably recognize this as from Ayers Rock. It's actually called Uluru, and it's a highly sacred uh, space to the indigenous people of uh, Australia. And lots of really cool rock art right here in the United States. So human beings talking about their pets and food for thousands of years. Nothing really changes. <laughs> However, my interest lies in what I grew up with, which is right in our backyard, the Bighorn Basin. Lots of it. I'm sure you guys already know that, having lived near one of the best rock art sites in Wyoming, Legend Rock, right? So what's really cool about Wyoming, though, is that a lot of our rock art focuses heavily on raptors or birds of prey. So we've got owls, we've got all sorts of different birds of prey, birds that eat other birds, meat eaters. And um, these are some examples of thunderbirds in our area. Most are from Mary Hendry's book, Wyoming Rock Art. But the one up in the upper right is from Larry Lowendorf and Julie uh, Francis's book, Ancient Visions. And that one's actually over by Dubois. It's like if you venture up by the Ring Lake area, you'll see a lot of the Thunderbird figures there as well. So what I'm talking about when I say the Bighorn Basin is everything that's kind of within that circle, like where we live, um, all the way down to the winds. And um, here is a map of the rock art sites from Jim Kaiser's book, Crow Rock Art in the Bighorn Basin. So the sites that you see uh, represent just a fraction of the rock art sites that are um, out there. These are um, the ones that are accessible to the general public. There are hundreds of sites that are not. <coughs> so I'm gonna talk about three different sites uh, that are in our area. The first one, of course, is Legend Rock. Uh, how many of you have been to Legend Rock? Well, I'm disappointed that not everyone's hands went up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Legend Rock has some of the most dramatic and visual um, rock art in the state. You don't have to look hard to see it. A lot of rock art that's out there is so faded over time that you can kind of see some detail, but not really. But Legend Rock is fantastic. It has some really crazy, like supernatural figures. You know that that's not based on anything in real life, right? Okay. And they have some really awesome um, wildlife out there. The image of the elk that is out there is the one that we actually use to illustrate the longevity of uh, migratory ungulates in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem when we did the invisible boundaries exhibit. But this guy is probably the guy that you guys recognize most from Legend Rock, right? The Thunderbird. Mm -hmm. He's so popular that he's even on the badge for Hot Springs State Park, okay? Which is pretty, pretty neat. But there is a second Thunderbird at the same site there, you can see them a little bit better. Similar style. And a third. We didn't chalk these. We actually, you know, technology has come a long way. <laughs> we don't chalk things anymore. We took a Sharpie and a photograph. It worked really well. <laughs> so, In a 1987 technician's report by Nancy Jo Arthur, she was hired by uh, like George Force Capture, who at the time was the Plains Indian Museum curator. Um, she was hired in the 80s to go out and document uh, these rock art sites. And so this was her technician's report from Legend Rock. And it basically talks about the proximity of a golden eagle nest to one of these Thunderbird petroglyphs that they were latex casting. We don't do that anymore either, by the way. And here is that same Golden Eagle nest in 2019. It was still there. 
All right, so the next site we're going to look at is 48BH350. Uh, this one's a little different from most of the sites that I visit. Um, it has a number of features. And it's not publicly known, so I'm sorry, no map for you guys. I can say that it is located between Grable and Worland uh, in public lands, but that's it. All right, so what's neat about this site, we have seven eagle traps. And we'll talk about eagle traps in a minute if you guys don't know what eagle traps are. And it has six rock art locations with 49 unique panels, several zoomorphs, which are figures, sort of transformative figures, and anthropomorphs, which are humanoid figures, like in transformation. So um, at one point, I thought, looking at this uh, rock art, I thought, oh, that's a, that could be a bird footprint, right? You know, maybe, maybe. But, you know, I had always assumed that. Upon closer inspection, for all I know, that could be tail feathers, right? It's kind of open to interpretation. It could be a pair foot. It could be, you know, when you talk about rock art, it's completely open to interpretation because unless you're talking to the artist who's been dead thousands of years, you really don't know what's going on. But these for sure are little bird, little bird footprints. Um, that we'll talk about is Ring Lake, Whiskey Basin. Um, it's approximately five miles outside of Dubois, Wyoming. Have any of you been over there? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, good. <coughs> so Ring Lake is beautiful. It's one of a series of three lakes that are over there. It's a, a great recreation area and once again, if you're talking about archaeological sites, the best way to find an archaeological site, right? If it's some place that maybe you would like to camp, right? Mm -hmm. We've been doing the same thing for thousands of years, people. So chances are it was a good place for camping back then, too. And so here we have several examples of what would be called zoomorphic rock art in the Dinwiddie tradition or figures in transformation. The upper left is a thunderbird with what's been theorized as hail emanating from its wings. You can't really see it. Um, and the lower right is a reproduction of a latex cast petroglyph from the same site called Birdman. So once again, that figure in transformation. There, that's a little bit better. Use that Sharpie again. So. Um, in 1975, there was a graduate student that did a study of the rock art here, and he found that there were 16 thunderbirds on the west side of the lake and nine on the east. And looking at the occurrence of thunderbirds in relation to the other figures is pretty significant. No other figure is represented that frequently, not even close. So it's like they keep sort of chiseling the same figure over and over and over again, right? So why, right? So these are a couple more. That is that, that's that one figure that was in uh, Julie and Larry's book. That's an actual photograph of that Thunderbird in the upper right corner. And the cool thing about Ring Lake is rather than it being a continuous rock wall like we have here at Legend Rock, right? Mm -hmm. It's on these huge boulders. These huge boulders that have kind of spalled away from the surface. And then it's like they went ahead and they just decorated the boulders, which is super cool too. Mm -hmm. And, ta-da, golden eagle nest. Mm -hmm. All right. So it seems clear that they're representing golden eagles, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Is it just me? <laughs> <laughs> so why, right? Um, I should mention that the crow word for golden eagle is the same word as thunderbird which is decagage. <coughs> so they recognize the fact golden eagle, sunbirds, same thing. And so the reverence of this, uh, this creature has gone back thousands and thousands of years, uh, even in cultures that predate human migration to North America. There was a paper released in 2010 called a Natufian Ritual Burial Event. 
and it's about a pre-Neolithic uh, cave burial dating to 12,000 before present in Levant, which is, re is now modern-day Israel. And this is the entrance to that cave. And this is the view from inside that cave. Once again, it's, it's really kind of like high elevation, looking down. Um, not a bad view. But what's really cool about this burial is there was carefully placed upon the remains of the shaman, they believe it's a shamanic burial, um, a fully articulated golden eagle ram. Okay? This is the National Geographic image of what the burial would have looked like based on the location of the objects that are, that are still there. And so here's a diagram of that burial. And what's really interesting, though, is that this shaman, it's female. It's a woman, which kind of dispels that myth of, you know, men doing everything. <laughs> men. <laughs> disregard the articulated human foot. I don't know what that was there for. <laughs> All right, so these uh, talons, these golden eagle talons, uh, have been used for adornment for thousands of years as well. Uh, the earliest known record is from a cave in Krapina, Croatia, dating to 130,000 years ago. And that's where these guys came from. And these, uh, these eagle talons were thought to be uh, strung on a necklace of a sort at one time, looking at the polish on the joint, they think that it was a necklace, much like the ones uh, that we have on exhibit at the museum in Cody. And it's just evidence that man has continued to try to associate, associate himself with this, this creature for hundreds of thousands of years, you know, or tens of thousands of years. All right, so back to the United States. Uh, Wyoming's been home to several Native American groups. I'm sure that you recognize some of the names that are listed up here. And what's interesting, though, is there appears to be Golden Eagle mythology associated with each one of these cultures. Uh, and many Native cultures, eagles are considered uh, to possess powerful medicine, magical powers, and they play a major role in religious ceremonies. And I'm sure you recognize some of the, like the totem pole that we would find in the Pacific Northwest. Well, the wooden, uh, the wooden, the carved wooden golden eagle on the left, that was found in a bog in Florida. So coast to coast, we've got people representing eagles in different sorts of ways over time. But because they possess such powerful medicine, the hunting or killing of an eagle was restricted by many taboos. Um, it required dedication, fasting, prayers, and spiritual assistance. And really, the only time that it was acceptable to, to harvest a golden eagle would be in times to collect those golden eagle feathers. And that's only some groups. Not every group does that. And so people have said, like, well, how do you know that it's like those thunderbirds aren't representing a bald eagle? Well, from Shoshone stories, it's like we have these these stories about the creator and creating Kisi Huchu, brown bird. Not brown bird with white head, brown bird, okay? That's pretty clear. And ingesting eagle meat was actually really taboo. And it's like they said that if you ate eagle meat, chances are you would turn into a monster. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So golden eagles were also called war eagles. They had strong association with warriors in battle, and they were frequently depicted in planes of Indian ritual iconography due to the medicinal, medicinal and spiritual significance of this animal among the tribe. And when I say medicine, I'm not talking about like Advil or Tylenol, okay? Just, you know. Um, it's the kind that is a creator granted power uh, to m communicate with a higher power. All right, so remember we talked about those eagle trappings just a minute ago? All right, this is what they look like. 
So in many plains cultures, they didn't kill the golden eagle, like I said. They would hide in these pits, just big enough for a, a crazy dude to be in, <laughs> and they would crouch down in there, and they would cover it with mountain mahogany or sagebrush, and they would have this stick, this forked stick with bait on it, and it was generally a cottontail rabbit. We found in our area that is the prey choice of most golden eagles. And this crazy dude would sit down there <laughs> with that bait <laughs> until a golden eagle would come in, <laughs> and he'd grab it. <laughs> Again, men. <laughs> okay? So I have to wonder, during this activity, how many fingers were lost? Yeah, you guys have seen those hand stencils, right? Where it's like, oh, whoop, guess what? <laughs> I'm wondering. <laughs> so, they would capture these golden eagles, and they would pluck three feathers. Mm. Two from the tail and one from the wing. Mm. And then release the bird. Because that's all you need, really. There's mm. no reason to kill it. And so Kenny Gash, a uh, local outfitter in Cody, came to one of my presentations and he's like, hey, guess what? We've got one of those. I'm like, get out. <laughs> Where? So we ended up hiking up to the end of the South Fork in Cody. And sure enough, there was an eagle trapping pit up there. It hasn't been used for hundreds of years, I'm sure. But what was really cool is there's a golden eagle nest about a quarter mile down that ridge. Still, eagles don't learn. <laughs> so what were they using these feathers for, right? It's like, it takes a lot of effort to even get one of these feathers, right? It's, yeah. I'm gonna pass on that activity. But um, what they would do is they would create these really beautiful feathered male gendered objects. Male activity, male gendered objects. Women did not mess with golden eagle feathers until more contemporary times, and now you see the girls at the powwows with the golden eagle wing and stuff. That before, that was never allowed. This is, this is one of the rare um, pieces that I've actually seen that uses more than just a few feathers. It actually uses the head. And this is a medicine hat that was created by the Crow people and um, the last time I was at the museum, it was still on exhibit in the Plains Indian Museum. So it's like, if you haven't been over there, you should absolutely go check out their collections. They're really, really cool. Beautiful feathered um, hair ornaments. And they used to say that these were ermine tails, right? They're looking at them now, and they're doing some DNA testing because they think they might be from black footed ferrets. Mm. Our, wow. And that, like in our area, that kind of makes more sense. Sure. You know, even out at Legend Rock, there's like two or three representations of what's been called, they called it a bear. Mm. I'm like, dude, that's a black footed ferret. Mm. It's like got the short little fat body and whatnot in the tail. Mm. But so that's kind of cool. And then they were also used on these really cool shields. So it's like with the introduction to, of the horse, to Native American groups here in, um, especially in the Big Horn Basin, <coughs> the shields used to be huge. It's like they found shields in the dry caves of Utah that were literally, you guys, if you've seen the shield-bearing warriors in rock art, it's, it's literally like their little head and their feet sticking out. They were that big. They were legitimately mm -hmm. that big. But now that they're on horseback, this is more of a sort of symbolic uh, medicine. And so it's like it had to be imbued with that strong, you know, protective medicine. And so we've got the bear, you know, we've got the golden eagle, so we've got the earth and the sky covered as far as protections, right? And you guys, you guys are probably like, dude, what do you know? Who are you? <laughs> right? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> this is part of what I did at the Draper. So not only am I an archaeologist, it's like I got to go out in the field with a wildlife biologist and go golden eagle trapping. Every, every year, we would go out in the spring and the summer months and we would trap fledgling golden eagles. We would repel into the golden eagle nests at four weeks and eight weeks. We would do flood work. We would look for ectoparasites and we would look for 
do esophageal swabs to see if they were getting the disease that um, raptors get from eating rock pigeons. Mm. We're lucky, we have like really clean birds. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you, it's pretty dang cool to feed beef heart to a golden eagle. <laughs> I would advise it. So working out in the field, you learn pretty quickly what's what. You can tell, you can differentiate a golden eagle nest from a magpie nest, from a raven's nest. It's like they're very different. And where golden eagles choose to nest is very specific. They like sandstone cliffs. I mean, bald eagles like to nest in trees. Golden eagles are antisocial. They don't want to be where people are, period. Um, that's why you'll see a lot of non-migratory golden eagles out in the Oregon Basin outside of Cody because there's only limited numbers of people that go out there and they're left alone. They're not like peregrine falcons that you'll see in the city. And so here is a map of golden eagle nest distribution in the Bighorn Basin. The blue indicates nests that are occupied. Uh, this is an older uh, older map, and we kind of like narrowed down our field area, our field study area after this, because it was just too much to monitor. And so, uh, like I said, we have a large population of non-migratory golden eagles. Uh, it's interesting, though, how many golden eagle nest sites in our study um, actually have rock art nearby. You know, we've got at least uh, quite a bit out in the Oregon Basin. It's also interesting to note that um, not only do golden eagles mate for life, they also choose the same nest sites over and over and over again. We find them coming back, so we band them, and we find them coming back to the same nest year after year after year, unless there's people around, and people just spoil everything, you know? And so then they'll have two or three alternative nests within like a, a one and a half kilometer area and then they'll go to those nests instead. But it's only if there's some sort of weird activity that's going on in their primary nest that they'll do that. In a 2004 study of deer falcon guano, and that's a nice way of putting it, guano, uh, they were looking to see what the long-term usage of nest sites were in Greenland of raptors, of deer falcons. And it was performed by Kurt Barnum, and they used this really highly technical equipment to test it. That's sarcasm, by the way. Um, and it was wire conduit. It's like, so they literally took like a wire conduit tube and just stuck it down through the poop and to see how long have they been continuously using this nesting site, right? These were their results. We have one nest that's been continuously used for almost 2,500 years. 2,500 years of continued use. So, if our Wyoming raptors are behaving similarly to these other raptors in Greenland, we could assume that these nest sites that we're seeing could be being utilized equally as long as these other. The question of space versus place in social sciences. Um, space is just space. It's just out there until something significant happens. And then it becomes place. And that's when I go to Legend Rock, that's what I think about. It's a place. It's not just space. It's something significant. People chose that site for a reason. People went to Legend Rock for a reason. People went to Ring Lake for a reason. It's very specific. Creating rock art, I don't know if you guys have ever tried to chisel um, a panel using rocks. No metal tools, pre-iron, rocks. It's labor intensive and it's not just something you do for fun. So it's clear that golden eagles or thunderbirds were important messengers, powerful medicine, and spiritually important to the people of the plains. And so it's not surprising that people would go carve these messages to them because they believe that they're the messenger to the creator. So it kind of makes sense that they're putting these messages near where golden eagle nesting sites are, right? 
or they're so magnificent it's no surprise that these lawyers are risking life and limb to go capture one just to get a couple golden eagle feathers that really symbolize achievement but and this is like the public service announcement <laughs> it's our responsibility every single one of us to protect these sites and vandalism continues to be a problem even out at Legend Rock. It's like we have issues of people sighting in their rifles on the rock art, even now, <laughs> even now. You'll go out there and suddenly you'll see like a new, a new chip out of a, like one of our 10,000 year old panels, which is super pleasant and pleasing. <laughs> and so we created an exhibit at the museum called Monarch of the Skies. And it's to draw attention to the challenges that Golden Eagles and archeological sites are having in Wyoming uh, from like wind farms, you know, people not being smart about placing wind farms. And it doesn't just disrupt the archeological record. It also, we found, they're putting it in paths of migration, whether it's Golden Eagle migration, uh, sage grouse or you know ungulates, uh, mule deer, pronghorn migration, and it it's getting better. I know that um, like the Nature Conservancy has started doing what's called smart sighting, and they're taking a lot of factors into consideration to find the ideal places to put these wind farms because there's no shortage of wind in Wyoming. That's something we have a lot of. And so Monarch of the Skies was created using decades of research uh, in the Western United States by the best scientists in our field. And how many of you have seen this? Oh my God, you guys, you go, <laughs> shame on you. Oh Lord. Where is it, where is it? It's at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, St. Cody, Wyoming. Hmm. So, yes. So part of the exhibit was the native voice. We wanted to be sure to include the native voice in the narrative of the Golden Eagle in the Bighorn Basin because they've been living here with this, uh, this animal way longer than we have. Or, well, I don't know there could be natives here. I'm sorry, Native American biologists. But we chose specific objects uh, to tell the story. And this one, the feathered bonnet, represents symbols of achievement, as does the mortarboard with the single golden eagle feather. Um, if any of you are aware of, of graduation rates among young Native American students, that truly is a symbol of achievement mm. and um, con commitment. So this exhibit, like I said, it now resides outside the Lower Draper lab and um, at the center of the West. And if you haven't seen it, go check it out. It's actually really cool. And there's a, like a lot of other really cool stuff at the center. Um, so who are we without our team? This is Dr. Charles Preston um, that was the co-curator with me on this. He is a, a wildlife biologist, sadly retired now and living in Arkansas. And thank you to a lot of people, and thank you, Barb, for inviting me. Uh, all right, so you guys, thank you so much, and if you have any questions, that's all I got for you.